Thank you very much. Thank you for the very kind intro. Thanks to Barney for inviting me. It's great to be out here to speak to the, uh, the British military. Um, despite my strong New York accent, I only came from London, so not, not, not too bad. Um, today, I think I'm going to try and actually do two, two things. The talk is titled The Post-Soleimani Response from Iran and Hezbollah, but the book and a lot of my, my prior research looks at Israel's long conflict with Hezbollah, and I'm really going to make try and illustrate the point that you can't understand the Iranian and Hezbollah response in light of the, the assassination of Soleimani unless you really understand the evolution of Hezbollah as a militant group, as an insurgency, and the evolution of the proxy relationship between Iran uh, and Hezbollah. So I'm going to try and wear two hats in case, other than Barney, I'm not sure who else is going to be here on uh, tomorrow night, where I'll focus more on the innovation and adaptation of the Israeli military vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah. Today I'll try and touch upon lots of that, lots of that, walk you through the evolution of the conflict uh, militarily, the evolution of Hezbollah, um, and then bring it up to what do we think the response is going to be based on everything that we know <laughs> from the 40 years of prior conflict from Iran and Hezbollah. Um, so first things first, sort of where, where are we now? We just have Hezbollah, the Lebanese Shiite militant group, fighting alongside the Syrian army of Bashar Assad, alongside the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is the Iranian sort of uh, you know, external branch of, of its military that does clandestine operations. The Quds Force is sort of the specialized, uh, uh, specialized unit of the IRGC all fighting together in Syria. You have the Israeli army carrying out airstrikes, hitting Hezbollah targets, Syrian targets, Iranian Revolutionary Guard targets inside Syria. Um, and then, lo and behold, we have the, the uh, Qasem Soleimani, who is the head of the IRGC Quds Force, or was, I should say, is killed um, in a convoy in Iraq alongside another Shiite militia leader. And then we have threats from Iran and from Hezbollah saying that we, we vow revenge against the U.S. military. Um, how did we get to this point? So I'm going to say that we really need to go back to understand Hezbollah as a group, as an organization. Because what we have is Iran promising a military retaliation at a time of its choosing. Um, and you have Hezbollah as sort of a, a proxy, a, a group that has a long cultivated relationship with Iran that received Iranian support from its inception threatening openly um, in its leader's speeches, and I'll, I'll draw upon that towards the second half of the speech. You have the leader of Hezbollah, a guy named Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General, saying that the number one target in light of the assassination of Soleimani is going to be the U.S. military um, and getting the U.S. military out of Iraq. That's sort of his threat. He puts it right out there. And he does qualify his, uh, his response, saying we're not going to target U.S. civilians in the region. We have uh, lots of tools at our disposal to target the U.S. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the conflict and then take short pauses through the evolution of the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah to sort of highlight important milestones that really animate our understanding of what the response from Hezbollah is vis-a-vis -vis the United States and it's, and it's Israel being um, viewed by Iran and Hezbollah as a U.S. extension, as a U.S. proxy. Um, I'll highlight the milestones in the conflict that will animate sort of our, our understanding of, of what the response is going to look like. But in light of the military audience here, I can't resist going through the Israel-Hezbollah conflict to sort of highlight the important lessons. It, it, it's an it's a extremely uh, rich conflict with lots of lessons that will resonate with the US and the UK um, regarding basically what not to do, mistakes that I think we ended up making the same mistakes we as in the, the U.S. and the U.K. that the Israeli army made uh, in Lebanon. So Israel gets involved in, uh, in Lebanon in 1982. Hezbollah doesn't even exist at this point. And, you know, Israel's primary conflict is vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian uh, militias who had been going from Lebanon, making these border incursions into Israel, carrying out attacks. And the Israeli army comes up with a plan in 1982 to invade um, to invade Lebanon to sort of crush the PLO militias that are carrying out these attacks, crossing into, uh, into Israel. And sort of the, the, the spark that causes the, the invasion of Lebanon is actually the assassination of the Israeli 
attempted assassination of the Israeli ambassador in uh, London, right outside the Dorchester Hotel, sort of precipitates Operation Peace for Galilee, as it's known um, in Israel. The Israeli army rumbles in to Lebanon to go after the Palestinian militias that were responsible. And they also have a secondary plan to sort of set up a, a, a government within Lebanon by a, a Christian leader that will sort of establish a peace, a peace deal between Israel and Lebanon. And we sort of know you, wise words don't start wars that you don't know how to stop. Um, they very quickly go, defeat these Palestinian militias. The, you know, they, they're basically wiped out. The remnants of the PLO leave Lebanon and go to Tunis. And what you have is the Israeli army basically hunker down in Lebanon, and they foment massive local opposition to their presence there. And this is sort of the incubator for where Hezbollah sort of materializes. Um, and this whole period is very important because it's sort of where Hezbollah cuts its teeth as an organization and evolves as, as a militia and as an insurgent group. Um, so what you have is Israel decides in order to um, sort of secure the border zone between Israel and Lebanon, they establish a security zone, as they call it, in 1985. And this is about a 400 square kilometer uh, area across the border between Israel and Lebanon, but inside Lebanon, that Israel's sort of going to patrol, act as a buffer for these, for that militia group, mili militants, can cross into Israel and carry out attacks. Now, what's, what starts, basically not understanding the nature of the enemy, foments massive local opposition, and um, amidst the sort of the civil war which had been raging in Lebanon, you have uh, Christians arming themselves, Sunnis arming themselves, Shiite arming, them, arming different groups and militias, just 50, 60 plus militias all fighting each other, sounds familiar. Um, and amidst the civil war, the Shiites, as one of the three major denominations of Lebanon, arm themselves. And you have a group called Amal, which is in a sense a predecessor to, to Hezbollah, which is the first time that you really have this uh, Shiite armed force. Um, and you take that with the Iranian Revolution, which happens in 1979, you sort of have this, this awakening of the Shiites across, across the globe. You have the first time the Shah of Iran falls, the, the Supreme Leader comes in, and you have sort of awakening of, of the Shiite militias. So amidst all this sort of the simmering, uh, the simmering currents, Israel has entered Lebanon, and they immediately, you know, um, become the targets of the Shiite militias. Um, and at the time, sort of militarily, Israel, if you keep in mind, this is 1982, 83, 45. This is nine years after the 1973 war, sort of the epitome of conventional warfare. You know, tank on tank, the famous armored corps battles in the Golan Heights between Syria and Israel. All of a sudden, they're fighting sort of low-intensity conflict, sort of messy urban warfare. But you know, in light of the near existential uh, loss that they faced in 73, they sort of view Hezbollah and all these militia groups not really worthy of any intellectual attention. Say, so, you know, we have to focus for the conventional war, we have to focus on the Syrian army that co might come rolling over the border again. They don't ever really devote attention to fighting low intensity conflict. And this sort of gives Hezbollah the time and space to sort of to incubate, to grow. And during this time period in the early 80s is when Hezbollah um, is founded and really very rudimentary guerrilla tactics, relying very heavily on terrorism. Um, this is a time period, if, if, if you recall, or you've read lots of the kidnappings of diplomats and journalists and visiting dignitaries. Even the, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury was sent, one of his envoys was sent to sort of negotiate hostage releases within Lebanon of Westerners, and he's Terry Waite, and he's, he's kidnapped as well. This is sort of that time period. You also have the bombing of the Marine Corps barracks. U.S. Marine Corps barracks killed 241 U.S. Marines. This was sort of a, a Hezbollah-Iranian plaza truck bomb, killed 241. There was also a simultaneous attack on a French paratrooper base, killed 58. And this is sort of where things start to go south. The U.S. had been in Lebanon um, as a multinational, part of a multinational peacekeeping force in light of the Civil War. Um, and the U.S. ends up leaving. Now, this is important because after Soleimani is killed 40 years in advance, when the leader of Hezbollah gets up on, on, in front of the, the television cameras, he says, we remember the effectiveness of, of suicide bombing. We remember 1983 for how we got the U.S. out of the region. So this is sort of 
um, quite a menacing um, declaration by the leader of Hezbollah in light of the Soleimani assassination to say, we didn't forget about 1983. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at the leader, the speeches of these militia leaders and speeches and interviews, especially in the, in the case of Hezbollah, extremely um, open, extremely candid for the group's sort of intentions, their strategic worldview. Um, it's really qu quite uh, eye-opening. And he also speaks with sort of a high degree of credibility um, historically over the years as, as sort of the leader of this group with sort of saying what he, meaning what he says and saying what he means. Um, so the, at the time though, the Israeli army sort of has conventional dominance over Hezbollah. I remember when I interviewed some, uh, some soldiers who were on the ground in the 80s, they say Hezbollah, they were really operating like the Iranians did in the Iran-Iraq war, sort of charging over minefields and running up, uh, trying to storm hilltop fortifications, and we were really mowing them down. I mean, he said Hezbollah didn't even know that we had night vision goggles, we used to shoot them down in the middle of the night. Um, but this all starts to change. The Iranians send the Revolutionary Guard very early on in the conflict between Hezbollah and Israel. Of course, Iran, their goal is to sort of export the Islamic Revolution and provide funding and support for its Shiite proxies around the world. This explains why we see uh, Iranian military support going to the Houthis and the Iraqi militias and the Shiite militias in Bahrain and, and elsewhere, all sort of the same ideological sentiment and also explains why um, Hezbollah eventually was called up to fight in Syria in 2012, and which is why Hezbollah of all groups is the one that's been in a way the most vocal in declaring a response, that there will be a response for the Soleimani uh, assassination. And just sort of understanding the origins of that proxy, uh, that proxy relationship. Um, it's a great example of the evolution of an insurgent group because Hezbollah starts to learn at this point, largely due to, to that Iranian assistance, that maybe the way we're doing things isn't so wise. Storming uh, hilltops is not a good idea. Running out in the open is not a good idea. And they eventually start to learn. They start to operate more at night. They get really good at, at IEDs, thanks to the Iranian assistance. And there's lots of techno-tactical adaptation on, on from, from a, uh, you know, EOD and bomb, and bomb perspective. Um, and Soleimani at the time, if you want to sort of keep two parallel tracks in your mind, is a soldier in the Iran-Iraq war. And Nasrallah, later on, when he gives his speech after Soleimani is killed, he says, you know, the Iranians who were bogged down fighting in the Iran-Iraq war, a terrible, really conventional war with hundreds of thousands, kills that even at that time they were sending Iranians to help us in Lebanon. Sort of highlights that long-standing um, relationship. There's also the theological component about um, the Shiite militias and Shiites around the world look towards Iran, the supreme leader for emulation, as God for guidance, etc. Um, just something worth keeping um, in mind. So, and the Ar Israeli army at this time doesn't really um, adapt itself. It still thinks that um, conventional war is what they need to focus on, but they have this simmering guerrilla conflict that they're involved in, and they don't ever really devote for a long time, the sort of necessary intellectual or operational attention. And this is what allows Hezbollah to sort of um, get better. So the second phase of the conflict between Israel and, and Hezbollah sort of starts in 1992. There's um, the ascension of a new Secretary General, who is Nasrallah, the current Secretary General, his predecessor, a guy named Abbas Musawi, who was spent a lot of time in Iran, had, was the first sort of class of graduates from the IRGC uh, advanced sort of military training they were doing up in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon, they had attended all the religious seminaries in Iran. And this is the first time that you really see Hezbollah use the Katusha rocket, which now we know we hear about every day, in a more systematic way. Um, because of Hezbollah's sort of growing uh, aptitude and, and, their, and their military ability, Israel decides to assassinate al Musawi. And what's important is that the response, you get this massive onslaught of Katusha rockets from Lebanon into Israel. Of course, this is now the, the primary weapon that's used by the various militias in Gaza and Lebanon into Israel um, against the, civil, the soft underbelly of the civilian population. But what's important is that Musawi is killed here, and it sort of sets up this equation of when Israel strikes Lebanon, rocket fire goes onto the Israeli civilian population. And I talk about it a lot more in the book, but it's sort of this unspoken or also spoken dialogue 
um, this sort of dueling dialogue between Israel and Hezbollah vis-a-vis um, the, the nature of uh, sort of what are the rules of the game and this sort of tacit understandings as well as each side deterring the other by their ability to hit the civilian underbelly and the IDF's ability, Israeli, Ar- Israeli Defense Force's ability to strike Lebanon. Um, I'm happy to go into that um, in the questions, but 1992 is also the first time, if you want to talk about military technology for a second, that Israel uses um, the sort of the fine, fix, kill, optical surveillance, targeted assassination from 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 an Apache helicopter to to take out Al Musawi. Just sort of a, and I'll try and get into that maybe a little bit tomorrow. You could catch it online, but um, sort of that the the, ro- the growing role of technology in Israeli military operations at this time um, is notable and it doesn't necessarily add up to the type of war that they're being forced to fight in Lebanon, sort of this grueling uh, counter guerrilla warfare. Sort of just some context, I should have mentioned it earlier, but Israel's Lebanon conflict is in a way, not quite, but sort of the equivalent of what the Vietnam War is to the United States. It's really considered a dark period for the military. They were bogged down in deeply unpopular war with all sorts of political issues. Um, you know, at the time, and this will sound familiar, they're sort of operating with one hand tied behind their back. There's a, there's a parallel track of, of peace negotiations between Israel and Syria, who is funding Hezbollah's military activity at the time. So what you have is Israel fighting Hezbollah, who is being armed by the people that they're negotiating with for peace. So it was a very complex and, and convoluted time period. The, they were, the army was never really given the bandwidth to military operate the way it wanted to. Um, and they were also focused on technological acquisition. They were also just like um, every other g- world military, they saw the, the success of the 1991 Gulf War, the, the amazing technology, the revolutionary technology that sort of, um, beca- look, they got to see it on display in Iraq where the US was able to you know, wipe out Saddam's army in, in a few minutes with, with such precision. And this actually leads to two large-scale air operations in the 1990s against um, Hezbollah. But actually, I should before I get to that, 1992 when Musawi is killed, Nasrallah says about the Soleimani uh, assassination, he goes, we have experience losing our own leaders, and we know what sort of the response needs to be um, when we lose a leader. And he says this sort of in one or two sentences, but I think the message and the underlying symbolism is crystal clear if you, under, if you understand the evolution of conflict and the history. Musawi is killed in February, and within five weeks, the Israeli embassy in Argentina is targeted by a, a Hezbollah-Iranian sort of suicide bombing, truck bombing, within five weeks. So this was, shows you sort of the, the rapid, first of all, to put, a, put, a, put an attack in play, in five weeks is pretty impressive. It shows you that they had assets. They had, this wasn't the first time they were thinking about it. They were ready for it. They had supplies in place. They had operatives floating around in South America. And this is five weeks after the assassination of Musawi. So when Nasrallah says today, we remember how to respond when we lose a leader, I think it illustrates, it, it should sort of make our ears uh, prick up regarding what their capabilities are, what their capabilities were 30 years ago compared to what they are today, it's only uh, improved. Also two years later, um, in 1994, there's a very large truck bombing, suicide bombing um, of a Jewish community center in Argentina, which was sort of the chosen, um, if you look at Iranian and Hezbollah operations over the years, soft targets, deniability, you know, it was very hard to pinpoint Iran and Hezbollah explicitly, but the, you know, the, the communique that was issued after this attack it was an unnamed group that was claiming responsibility in light of these, the uh, Musawi assassination. So this is the kind of stuff that Hezbollah has historically done when a, a leader of importance has been killed. And when Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, mentions this in a speech today, unless you know the history, which is why I'm sort of taking you through the, the extent of the conflict, I think people may miss, miss that, sort of miss the reference. Um, and this was against a soft, a soft civilian target, killed 85 civilians. Um, so after 92, Nasrallah takes over, who's been in power now, been Secretary General for 20, 20 plus um, years. And this is also the time period where Israel sort of toys with, well, actually I shouldn't say toy, deeply embraces sort of the Western, 
what we now know is sort of the Western way of war because of sort of casualty sensitivity, because of an infatuation with technology, because of the technology that's been tried and tested. Everybody saw the Gulf War. They said, this stuff works. Let's get some. And this affected lots of Western militaries all around, around the world. Um, so they start to try and use this technology and the sensitive shooter technology and the Air Force to target Hezbollah in these various air operations in light of the, the increased rockets. But, you know, the Air Force can't fight counter guerrilla warfare well, as I think everybody uh, knows. It's, it's not, and it didn't really do the trick. Israel was still, yeah, still had soldiers on the ground there. The Air Force wasn't doing the job. Um, never really was able to stifle the tempo of, op operational tempo of, of Hezbollah. Um, now, what's sort of interesting is that it's important to keep in mind that the Air Force in the 90s didn't do the trick against the rockets. And this was sort of a lesson that Israel didn't really take to heart when 2006 came around, um, which was a 34-day war between Israel and Hezbollah, sort of brought Hezbollah out onto the world stage. And we'll get there in just a sec. But just you'd think the lessons from the 90s, they would have learned from 2006, but that wasn't really the case. Um, Sort of an interesting thing I want to highlight, in the mid-90s, a, a new general takes command of the northern arena, which is the northern command where Lebanon is, that's sort of the AOR. Um, and he's, in a way, the General Petraeus of the IDF, where he says, we need to stop what we're doing, and we need to focus on counter-guerrilla warfare, or counter-insurgency, but minus the Hearts and Minds campaign, I guess. Um, the counter-guerrilla uh, campaign. And, you know, through, and I, in the questions I could get into it, but um, through the innovative processes pushed forward by the creation of a special forces unit, which was meant to specialize in sort of counter Hezbollah, counter guerrilla war, and they, they became pros in bush warfare and reconnaissance and um, being in deep cover for weeks at a time on, a, on enemy, uh, on enemy uh, soil. I think actually some of them at one point, there was sort of an exchange between, it's called the Egos Unit, which actually translates as, as Walnut, not exactly a menacing name for a unit, but they, uh, they, they, they sort of perfected being in the Lebanese terrain and, and dealing with Hezbollah, and they start to sort of pull the rest of the army up to speed. They, they sort of are given the, um, the space to take risks and be creative and come up with solutions, and then they, as sort of the incubator for these new tactical changes, go back to their, to the rest of the army, to Northern Command, and give everybody a crash course before you go and you're sent to Lebanon. Sort of a very interesting way that the innovative process um, goes. And there's a lot about that in the, in the book, and I'm happy to get into that a little bit more in the, in the questions. And it, you know, also he had a very, this guy, this general, um, had a very open and, open and receptive culture. You know, organizational culture, the IDF, is sort of a very uh, informal, everybody. No one is in nice, nice pressed uniforms like you guys. Everyone has, you know, open shirt with a chest hair, and everyone has nicknames for each other. Um, he was basically receptive to soldiers on the ground who said, "We don't know. We don't have the tools. We don't know what we're doing when we fight Hezbollah. We, we're bumping into these guys in these villages." Um, and uh, he's sort of receptive to that. So that sort of just illustrates how the change was sort of uh, the origins of the innovation and, and basically shifting. The first time they realized we don't need to focus on 1973 Syrian tanks rolling over the border anymore. We need to look at counter guerrilla warfare. Um, and they do start to make improvements. Now, at this time, we're moving into the late 90s. If you want to fast forward again, Nasrallah, in a speech after the death of Soleimani, says, This was a period in the 90s when the Iranians really start to help us. And if, you're, if, you, if, if you remember, Soleimani becomes head of the IRGC Quds Force in 1998. And, they, and Nasrallah says, 1998, when we were fighting Israel, was a very important year. Our friend Soleimani becomes head of the Quds Force, and he starts to send us all sorts of goodies. He comes personally to Lebanon, and we make great gains in Lebanon, 1998 to 2000. They start, the, the tempo goes way up, even though the Egos and the Israelis and their special forces units were doing very good work and were able to sort of put a lid on some of the grill activity. Hezbollah moved towards indirect activity, a lot of mortar fire, um, and even though the Egos was doing well, the number of attacks kept on rising. The casualties, about 20 Israeli uh, deaths a year. Hezbollah was always losing more soldiers, but never really changed the sort of uh, political dynamic and strategic situation. It's like a slow drip. Eventually, in um, 
in 2000, Israel decides enough is enough. There's a prime minister elected on, uh, on sort of the platform of getting out of Lebanon, getting out of the Lebanese swamp, the Lebanese mud. Um, and it's a great case study of how sort of civil society um, impacts the political decision make political leaders to get out. You know, the military equation hadn't really changed, but you had massive street protests in Israel, like 10% of the population of the whole country were out in the streets saying we need to get out of Lebanon, enough is enough. Um, and they do. And again, 25 soldiers killed a year. You know, there's, there's probably 10 times that killed in car accidents, but because of the nature of the war, the very murky pretenses from which the war was started in 82, the fact that this security zone sort of became uh, this sort of, uh, was like the test, the test lab between Israel and Hezbollah for 18 years, enough is enough. Um, now to sort of move uh, a little bit quickly through um, from 2000 onwards, well, I guess just sort of the key lessons from this 18 year um, odyssey are basically number one, Hezbollah is a versatile learning organization as, as, a, as a, what started as a ragtag bunch of guerrillas who are kidnapping diplomats and kidnapping journalists and doing truck bombs, by the end of the, by 2000, have ro all, all, all sorts of missiles, all sorts of rockets, sort of perfected guerrilla warfare, advanced IEDs, operating at night, night vision goggles, lots of Iranian training, Soleimani on the ground from 98 onwards at times. Um, it also highlights sort of that patron-client relationship between Iran and, and Hezbollah, which sort of explains why Hezbollah is so vocal with the death of Soleimani. It also shows sort of that patron-client relationship between Syria and Hezbollah, which is why you have Hezbollah in Syria today. You know, no such thing as a free uh, lunch. Um, so when the regime um, is sort of threatened in, in Syria, um, Hezbollah sends their guys over there to fight alongside them. And he gives, Nasrallah gives a great speech not too, not too long ago where he goes, you know, only an idiot wouldn't support the, uh, the regime that has been such a cherisher, a supporter of the resistance, meaning Hezbollah, over the years. Um, it also sort of illustrates um, the inability of sort of the Air Force to, to, to adequately target and deal with these Hezbollah guerrillas who's sort of fighting in a, basically tailor their operational approach to circumvent Israeli conventional and technological superiority. Um, and this is familiar, I think, with stuff that we all, um, everyone at all Western militaries have to deal with when the enemies don't play by the same rules. Um, they pull out in 2000 and they sort of say we're going to, Israel says that we're going to hit Hezbollah for any border infraction that happens. And between the six years after the war, Hezbollah has an encroachment, they kidnapped a soldier. And there's all these little infractions into Israel proper without any response. And this is a major erosion of Israeli deterrence and contributes to that miscalculation that Hezbollah makes in, Ju in, uh, in July 2006, where they do the same thing they did a year prior. They go alongside the border fence, they sneak in, they, they, they set off a charge that damages a, a, a jeep, an unarmored jeep filled with army reservists. Um, kills three and kidnaps two, pulls them back into Lebanon. And this sort of sparks the 2006 war, which we know, uh, you know, blows onto the world stage in 2006. It's sort of, but what happened was the lessons that a lot of people drew from 2006 didn't adequately look at this sort of 20 years of fighting that Hezbollah had, that the Israeli army had, to sort of explain how each side approached the conflict um, in 2006. Um, now, the 2006 war is a long and complex one, and I'm happy to get into it if there's interest in, in sort of the questions. But it doesn't go, it's basically, they fight each other to a standstill. Um, and Israel on the eve of war, after having spent most of the 80s and 90s focusing on high intensity thinking and worrying about the Syrian army and the Iraqi army sending missiles and the Syrian army sending tanks, for the, for the years prior to 2006 are focused on strictly counterterrorism. If you remember in 2000, it's the Palestinian Intifada, you know, the, the uprising, and there are these suicide bombings all over the place, buses, cafes, and they devote a lot of resources and operational attention to counterterrorism, going, uh, you know, a lot of raids and checkpoints and that kind of stuff. And what it really does is it erodes the army's ability to fight higher tempo conventional warfare. So the, and, you know, in the 70s and 80s, the pendulum was here, 
and then it swings all the way to the opposite end of the spectrum towards low intensity. This is sort of on the eve of war, their operational uh, approach. Also, just like in, in all Western militaries that increased post-heroism or casualty aversion, nobody wants to lose soldiers. Everybody has the technology and the kit to sort of prevent that. Everybody wants to rely as much as possible, understandably, um, on the Air Force and on you know, uh, standoff firepower. Um, and there's also this reticence to get re-engaged in the Lebanese mud, the swamp. You know, they, they spent 18 years there, and then six years later, here we go again. So there was a real sort of social, you know, aversion to really getting distant up, get, getting tangled up. Um, and of course, there was the influence of, of the air, air power and the sort of revolution of military affairs and this sort of wave of tech, technology that sort of swept through Western militaries in the 90s. Everybody saw, like I said, how great the U.S. did in Iraq in 91, where Saddam's army was. Of course, everybody drew the wrong lessons because Saddam was incapable and the Iraqi army was inept. But everybody felt we can fight wars like this. We can fight with an over-reliance on the Air Force. But what also happened was all that technology is very expensive. And what happened was there was training cuts to the reservists, training cuts to the ground forces. They weren't doing um, you know, division exercises. And the Army and ground forces are basically unprepared on the eve of 2006 for this very gritty um, war. Hezbollah was not the Hezbollah of the 90s. Nasrallah, in his speech, once Soleimani is killed, says from 2000 to 2006, Soleimani helped us immensely grow to where we went from 2000 to 2006. He gets us advanced Iranian missiles, not just these, you know, uh, on imprecise Katusha rockets. We have missiles, mid-range, long-range, Fajr, Zilzals, um, gets us drones, and we you know we saw the use of, if you want to talk about a precursor, you know, weaponized drones in 2006, Hezbollah strapping small drones just with, print, with crude explosives and trying to fly them into Israel. You also saw in 2006 already surface-to-ship missiles that Israel had, these Chinese, I'm sorry, that Hezbollah had, C-802, um, you know, surface to ship, and they send Hezbollah fires one off that hits an Israeli naval corvette um, in, in the waters that were imposing a blockade on Lebanon. And all this stuff is sort of mentioned in Nasrallah's speech. When Soleimani is killed, he gives his grand eulogy and he gives about four speeches um, afterwards. He says, All this was because of Soleimani. He got us the drones, he got us the missiles, um, and um, sort of highlighting the importance of, 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 of that, this sort of, the, of the assistance. And then on top of all the icing on the cake, the chief of staff for the first time in Israel's history is from the Air Force in 2006. Historically, it was ground, ground forces, armor corps, for the first time ever get a fire plant as the chief of the general staff. Um, and I wouldn't overstate it, but I think it certainly affected his outlook. You know, there was generals, rightly or wrongly, who I interviewed after the war, and they say, the chief of staff, he saw everything through the cockpit. You know, he can never identify with the ground forces. He didn't understand what it takes. He thought everything was from the cockpit. Um, a little bit of an oversimplification, but, but still uh, worth keeping in mind when you look at how the Israelis decided to deal with Hezbollah in 2006. Um, so 2006 war doesn't go exactly as planned. Each side basically fights to a standstill. Um, it was a mediocre performance by the Israelis. To call it a resounding uh, defeat would not be accurate, but for the conventionally superior Israeli military to sort of have this Mediocre performance against Hezbollah, you know, who loses about 800 guys, um, and large areas of support in Lebanon are sort of uh, destroyed. But Israel is before the Iron Dome, this short-range missile defense system. So there's rockets landing in Israeli civilian areas. Um, it was hard for Israel to sort of project a victory narrative when there's rockets flying until the very last day. This, of course, led to the very quick sort of technological innovation of the Iron Dome, which now has essentially um, neutralized the, the short-range missile threat, but you know each side, the rockets stopped being less effective, then they moved to tunnels, and then we saw that, and it goes back and forth. Um, but sort of 13 years on, from 2006, we basically had relative quiet. Israel gave Hezbollah hammering, Hezbollah gave Israel a bloody nose, each side says we sort of are deterring each other. Sort of, each side knows the other one could do some pain and some damage on the other, and there's sort of this simmering quiet. And how long is that going to last? Maybe some, some, some stability finally? 
But of course, in 2011, the Syrian conflict kicks off, so not much uh, quiet. And we know, uh, you know, the, the popular uprising against Assad, the, the state failure of Iraq, the the marginalization of uh, of, of the Sunnis in Iraq leads to the you know I, the, the rise of ISIS and and the Sunni rebels and this toxic uh, combination of everybody fighting each other. And what do you have? You have quite quickly, um, secretly in 2012, but he publicly admits it in 2013, um, Hezbollah sends their guys alongside Assad. And this is when Nasrallah gives this sort of speech. He goes, only an idiot would support the regime that, that gave us so much support over the years. Soleimani um, is on the ground in Syria more than one would ever think a senior commander would be. And sort of in Nasrallah's eulogy, he sort of highlights that. You want to talk about um, sort of the, the command culture, this guy is, you know, the top brass on the ground alongside the rank and file. You know, I heard somebody once compare him. He's basically the Iranian equivalent of Eisenhower. You know, that's how much esteem he's sort of, for an American audience, <laughs> um, that's how, you know, how high of esteem they sort of held him. But he's on the ground. And you also have in 2013, Russia rumbles in. So it's really uh, quite a mess. But you want to ask, why is Hezbollah in Syria? So number one, we illustrated that allegiance to Iran, long-standing proxy relationship, um, the deep ties going back to the support from the 80s and the 90s and through the 2000s, weapons and financial, Syria being a patron of, uh, of Hezbollah, also providing that support and that political cover. Uh, there's the ideological affinity. Though it became tricky for Hezbollah because their ideology historically was Israel's their number one enemy, and we have to go after Israel because they are now still, you know, disputing this small little area on the border that each side says is, is, is the others. They now have to say, well, we're in Syria. So you, what does that have to do with Israel? They say, oh, well, ISIS and the Takfiris are a Zionist extension. So that's how they ideologically justified it uh, quite poorly, in my opinion. But they are uh, on the ground in, uh, in Syria. They're lose, they've lost a lot of uh, soldiers, of, of militiamen. Um, and there are domestic grumblings in Lebanon amongst the Shiite population in Lebanon saying, why are we sending our guys, our sons, to go fight in Syria to fight ISIS and, and, and you know, far away from South Lebanon um, and they're losing people. So there is a, a little bit of domestic dissatisfaction. Um, lost a lot of fighters, including experienced fighters. You know, the head of the, uh, their militia apparatus was killed in, in Syria. They've lost a lot of gray-haired senior guys, so you lose, in a way, that um, that uh, organ, uh, tacit organizational knowledge that sits in, in the heads of these of these senior guys. You see the faces of the soldiers going there now, or the, the militiamen going there now, are baby-faced. They've dropped the recruitment age. So they are. They've lost, by some counts, 16, 17, um, 1,600, 1,700 uh, in, in Syria, with many more wounded. They're also forced to then pay payments for their martyrs and the martyrs' families at a time when Iranian budgets are tightened, Hezbollah the same. So it's not exactly, um, hasn't been all rose petals for Hezbollah in, in Syria. It also led and I think contributed to their designation by the European Union and eventually by the UK for, as a terrorist organization and being, taking part in sort of war crimes against the civilian population in Syria and you know, pre contributing to starving out certain certain towns in Syria. Um, but the plus side is that they, they have, they've received, in a sense, what you could call their Russian military education. The Russians are on the ground there, and you have the Russians and the Syrians and Hezbollah all sort of rubbing elbows with, with each other. And Hezbollah is exposed to sort of the Russian technology, the Russian kit, the Russian way of doing things. Um, they, even at one, some operations, Russian air support is supporting these Iranian Hezbollah militias on the ground. So there is some value in that regarding the organizational knowledge and the, and, and the sort of the skill set that you, that you develop. They also historically used to fight Israel on their home turf um, within their own villages. And now they're sort of having to do much larger formations, urban warfare in, in an unfamiliar territory. It's been, I mean, they've developed um, some skills in Nasrallah whenever he threatens Israel. And now the US, he says, you know, everybody knows the lessons that what we learned in Syria what we learned um, while fighting. You know, we've gotten, we're way more advanced, way better than yet we ever were before. Um, 
So that's sort of the pros and cons of the, the, the Syrian experience for Hezbollah. Now, um, and Israel, of course, just to sort of give in, in, in one minute why we see these Israeli airstrikes against Syria, against Hezbollah, against Iran. Israel's basically outlined as sort of three red lines. Number one, no Iranian or Syrian weaponry, no game-changing weaponry can get from Syria, Iran to Hezbollah. And this would include longer range rockets that can penetrate the heart of the country, no chemical weaponry, no sophisticated drone technology. And you always hear um, you know, unclaimed airstrike at a munitions dump uh, outside Damascus airport. Um, these are um, the, the you know, un unannounced Israeli airstrikes trying to prevent the sort of game changing weaponry that goes, comes off the planes from Iran and Damascus or the other military airports and then gets on the Beirut Damascus highway into Lebanon. So this is sort of the one red line. The second red line is no Iranian, Syrian, Hezbollah presence in the, in the Golan Heights, on the Syrian side of the Golan Heights, which is part of Syria. You know, historically, Hezbollah is right up on the border with Lebanon and Israel. But now, given they're in Syria, they're trying to encroach from, from, from the Golan Heights as well. Of course, it's a strategic overview over the north of Israel. And you've seen airstrikes against Iranian Revolutionary Guard in the Golan Heights. Um, and that whole whole region, um, as as you know, as recently as uh, a week ago, um, so that just sort of contextualizes that for you. Um, so we've sort of seen the origins of the Israel Hezbollah conflict, how Hezbollah got the fighting experience, their fighting experience against Israel, how Israel sort of started high intensity with a focus on high intensity conventional warfare, eventually shifts with a lot of difficulty to sort of counter guerrilla warfare, but then slides too far down that scale towards low intensity conflict when they're not prepared for Hezbollah, who basically fights bang in the middle in 2006 with, with rockets and um, you know not just uh, defensive operations, but offensive operations and, and, and sort of really war amongst the people, to quote you know, General Rupert Smith. Um, and we also see the origins of that Iran-Hezbollah relationship and the Iran-Syria-Hezbollah relationship. Um, and also sort of some of the failings of Israeli, uh, or the, of Israeli technology, not Israeli technology, but the over-reliance on technology and the Air Force in, in 2006. But now I wanted to get into, I still have uh, like 10, 15 minutes or so just to talk, or actually no, probably slightly less, five minutes, just to sort of, uh, so we understand the origins of the relationship. And now when Soleimani is killed, like I said, a huge figure for this, uh, for Hezbollah, for Iran, for the, all the Shiite militias. And you basically have a fascinating uh, response from Hezbollah. It basically outlines very clearly what the response is going to be. Keep in mind Soleimani, as a veteran of the Iran-Iraq war, real miserable conventional warfare, says Iran is never going to fight that kind of war again. We're not going to fight conventional war. Basically writes the book on, on sort of asymmetric warfare. Or the, you know, Nasrallah, when he eulogizes him, he says Soleimani developed the school, the Soleimani school of thought. He says this in his speech, which is, you know, there's conventional military of the Iranian military, asymmetric tactics, um, proxies via all their various militias, cyber war, and, and terrorist operations. Um, and the asymmetric stuff we know from, you know, the swarming attacks in the Straits of Hormuz to the drones and, and crashing armored drones into targets. Um, and the various proxies that they've been supporting for years, Hezbollah, the Shiite militias in Iraq, you know, some of these, these, these guys, Assad al-Haq, and uh, these groups in Basra, etc., the Bahraini militias, the Houthis are getting Iranian missiles and technology, that they're sending Iranian missiles into Saudi oil fields. All this is sort of in the arsenal of the possible response. Um, but Nasrallah basically says very clearly, in response, if the U.S. would have targeted somebody if they only would have targeted Iranian military depot or a different figure. We would let Iran do the responding. But because they targeted Soleimani, all the axis of resistance, all the Shiite militias, the Shiite proxies are required to respond how they see fit. And he gives, in a way, Iran deniability. He says, um, Iran isn't asking us to respond, but we, as a part of the axis of resistance are, will respond how we see fit. So even if, if a Shiite militia targeted, you know, gives them this modicum of deniability, even though I think it wouldn't get them very far because the U.S. 
if the U.S. was struck by a Shiite proxy, I think that return address is still um, Iran. But he says very clearly that our goal is to now get the U.S. military out of Iraq, and our target will be the U.S. military in Iraq. And we remember how successful 1983 was, and we also remember what it's like to lose um, our own leaders, i.e. Musawi in 1992 when the bombing of the embassy, Israeli embassy, 94 at the Jewish Community Center. And we remember a suicide bombing got the U.S. to leave last time. These are all fairly ominous uh, references that he's giving in his speech. And he says, you know, the U.S. has to get out of Iraq, and, you know, soldiers who came in vertically are going to leave horizontally in, in coffins. And he says this, and he does sort of this hand signal, which is now he does this. You know, they came like this, and they're going to leave. Well, I'm not doing it right. They came like this and leave horizontal. Now you have all the, these various, you know, the, the pro Hezbollah, pro Iran crowd. You could see online, everyone is sort of, you know, posting pictures, doing this. Um, and he said, U.S. military, U.S. government institutions in, in the Middle East are fair game. Um, now, how this is going to materialize and when we know Hezbollah, Iran, within five weeks of losing Musawi in 92, were able to hit the Israeli embassy, um, but up to two years. And he says very clearly in his two years was when the Jewish Community Center attack was. Nasrallah says, um, this is the long, it's a long game. Uh, he says, this, this, our response will be the long course. Um, and the U.S. is gonna is gonna know it's gonna come. It won't come tomorrow. But this is they've changed. It's a new phase of 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 a new phase in in the region that the U.S. would do um, what it did. But he does say we won't target U.S. civilians. He said we know there's lots of journalists and doctors and businessmen in the Middle East, in Iraq, and elsewhere. They're not our targets. Now, of course, a big question is: Do you believe him? Number two, does he speak for all the other Shiite militias that are roaming around the region? Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the answer is. Do you think some of these Iraqi militias, which are much less tightly controlled, are going to abide by those declarations? Um, that's, that's a big um, sort of intelligence gap. But he says we need, to, we need to hit the US and enact sort of a fair, what's a fair price, or what's a just equation to, to losing Soleimani? Is it the Secretary of Defense? Is it head of Central Command? And he sort of floats all these ideas about people that they could hit, but doesn't obviously answer his own question, sort of leaves it dangling. He, he sort of leaves it out there in his speech. All very uh, quite menacing. And in a way, for Hezbollah, focusing on Israel for 30 years, their shift or this look at the U.S. is in a way going back to their origins, 82, when they hit the U.S. Marine Corps barracks. They were founded in 82. We want to get foreign troops out of Lebanon, the U.S., France, Israel. And now you have this... It's almost like we're going back to where we started, where there's this look now at the U.S. Um, and of course, um, there's a long history of, uh, of terrorist uh, operations by Hezbollah and Iran. There, you know, Bulgaria blew up an Israeli tour bus. All very opaque, with gives Iran, Iran and Hezbollah deniability, sort of the name of the game in this sort of asymmetric uh, world. And just it's worth adding, you know, there was three. In light of Nasrallah saying we're not going to hit civilians, um, that's all great. There has been there's been arrests of three sort of Hezbollah external operatives in the in the U.S. in the last two years, guys that were doing surveillance of uh, tourist targets, government targets, law enforcement targets, military targets, recruitment stations in Manhattan, Macy's, Rockefeller Center, Statue of Liberty, and this is all out in the open. These are the three different guys: one arrested in New York, one Michigan, and one New Jersey. And I could talk. Uh, a lot about those because I think they're, they're fascinating. But for all those sort of, I don't think we should rest easy because Nasrallah says we're not going to target you as civilians. This one operative, if you, according to the court, the court papers and stuff, was sent as early as 2003 to the U.S. to sort of be a, a sleeper. You know, that, this is what the FBI has sort of called these guys as early as 03, doing surveillance, going to different, uh, going to South America and casing American targets and Jewish targets and Israeli targets. Um, so this is sort of the kinds of tools that Iran and Hezbollah has sort of in their uh, arsenal. And Hezbollah being, the, in a way, the most prominent proxy. Nasrallah being the most recognizable sort of uh, spokesman for this broader Shiite axis with the most credibility. He's very articulate. Um, has sort of been the one to deliver these various threats um, through uh, his speeches. Of course, Iran sends those two rockets to the two bases in Ain al-Assad and Erbil. And then 
The foreign minister tweets, we've concluded our military response. Nasrallah follows up and says, yes, that was the military response, and it's amazing that for the first time since World War II, you know, people are hitting U.S. military bases with missiles like that. But he says that's just the first slap, um, and our response sort of is still coming. And the speeches are in incredible to read because they're so uh, threatening, so ominous. Um, but I hope with that I've sort of saturated you with probably more information than you want about the long conflict between Israel and Hezbollah, which really provides the context for understanding Hezbollah and their response um, and why they're sort of so tightly intertwined with Iran, understand some of the references and allusions that he's been making in his speeches, Nasrallah has been making in light of the Soleimani death, also the long history of Iranian Hezbollah sort of cooperation and support, um, as well as, just because I couldn't resist my, you know, couldn't resist, to tell you, tell you a little bit about the evolution of Hezbollah as a, as a militant group and the evolution of the Israeli army sort of way of fighting um, Hezbollah. And there'll be a little bit more on that uh, tomorrow, but you could save the trip to Aldershot if you want and just find it online uh, later. But now with that, I know a little short on time, but any, any questions at all, I'd be happy to, 